Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of Business Standard, let me extend a very warm welcome to the Honorable Union Commerce Minister, Shri Priyash Goyal, on the second day of the Business Standard Month. And, uh, just a prelude, sir, for you. Uh, starting this year, we are embarking on a year-long journey of celebrating 50 years of Business Standard, uh, which is one of India's most respected business dailies. We started life on March 27, 1975, uh, perhaps the only good thing to have happened in that fateful year. Initially published from Kolkata, it was Calcutta then, with a cover price of 40 paisa, Business Standard is now a 13 strong edition strong national brand and commands the highest cover price amongst all newspapers in the country, well, again, a lucky rupees 13. And to mark this occasion, we are holding this two-day annual summit for dissecting business and economic thoughts. And this national summit of thought leaders, christened as Manthan, is themed around the topic that uh, Gitika has already spoken about, to develop India by 2047, the roadmap. We hope uh, Manthan this year and in the years to come will provide a forum to policymakers, government decision makers, and industry leaders to deliberate on major economic, business, strategic policy options and challenges that face the Indian economy and the many sectors that have the potential to drive country's economic growth. Honorable Commerce Minister, we are indeed grateful to you for agreeing to be here with us today, despite your demanding schedule amidst a very busy election season. Uh, Mr. Goel needs no introduction to this audience, but yet I'll do it for form's sake. He's a Union Minister for Commerce and Industry, Consumer Affairs, Food and Public Distribution, and Textiles, and leader of the Rajya Sabha. Uh, Ms. Goel has had a long and fruitful political and social life. He strongly believes in good economics makes for good politics and that the country is today at the cusp of a development explosion. Uh, during his current tenure as Minister of Commerce and Industry, the country achieved the highest ever exports in 2021 and 22. He led the signing of the free trade agreement with the UAE, the fastest ever negotiated FTA globally between India and Australia, the ECTA, India's first segment with a developed country after a decade. And for the first time anywhere in the world, under Mr. Goel's watch, the country signed the FTA with the European Free Trade Association countries that ties market access to almost 100 billion investment commitments. Mr. Goel also oversaw the launch of the production-linked incentive scheme to bring manufacturing at the center stage and emphasize its significance in driving growth and creating jobs. As Minister of Consumer Affairs, Food and Public Distribution, he's led the implementation of the world's largest food security program, the Pradhan Mantri Garib Kalyan Yojana, by distributing free food grains to nearly 80 crore people over two years, providing support to the poor, vulnerable, weaker sections of society who were affected most during the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you so much, Honorable Minister, for agreeing to be with us today. May I now invite you to please deliver your keenly awaited special address. Thanks. Over to you, Mr. Goel. A very, very good morning to all the friends who have assembled here today to celebrate a journey of 50 years of independent, fearless, objective, and I would say outstanding service to the nation, reporting about the growth, reporting about good things, reporting about where we are going wrong, helping us decode and understand the India growth story over 50 years. My compliments to you, editor. My compliments to you, Mr. Bhattacharya. And to the entire business standard team. In fact, uh, as a nation, we pride ourselves. And when I'm doing all these free trade agreement negotiations, I always say, that nowhere else in the world will you get an opportunity to invest where not only do we have a vibrant democracy, democracy demographic dividend, huge diversity, big demand, but you can be rest assured that with the two pillars of the judiciary and a vibrant and a very, very independent, fierceness media covering your back, you can be very confident that you won't be successful, make 
make uh, value, create value for your business, become wealthy, and then land, land up becoming a professor in a university in Japan with everything else taken away from you. You don't know which case I'm referring to? You've heard of Jack Ma, haven't you? And what happened to him? Sorry? In India, that doesn't happen because we have the media playing a very important role in the protection of democratic rights in making sure that uh, we deliver on our promises and reporting back all the achievements and the shortcomings. And 50 years has truly been a glorious journey, churning of ideas, giving newer perspective to the way the country thinks, works, the way government delivers on its promises. And what better day than today for me to get an opportunity to address particularly the young minds in this room. Today is Shiv Jayanti, where we are celebrating Shivaji, Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj anniversary. And it's truly a, a leadership that Shivaji Maharaj gave to the country at a very important cusp in India's history that for the first time established India, that is Bharat, as a nation. It was for the first time that India started thinking of itself as a unified single country where we started focusing on infrastructure, strengthening the forces to be able to protect our borders, all the forts that came up across the, uh, the Maratha Empire. For the first time, India started looking at creating a navy of its own to protect our shores. And uh, I think in today's geopolitical world, with so much stress, so much happening across the world, two conflicts, the uh, one in Ukraine, the one with uh, Palestine and Israel, with the Red Sea under threat, we can all imagine that what a glorious history we have and how much we have to be grateful to our uh, past for the learnings that India has benefited from. In fact, the Honorable Prime Minister, while uh, addressing the nation on, about Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj, had said, and I'd like to quote, to build Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj's Bharat, the journey will be of good governance and self-reliance. This will be the path of a developed India. And to my mind, the leadership and devotion which Prime Minister Modi has given to the nation, the devotion towards the nation, the devotion towards the welfare of the poor, his, his empathy to the less privileged sections of society so that they also get a better opportunity in life, and his confidence to make India once again re reclaim its old lost glory. That truly, in a way, resonates with what Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj had brought to the nation, had offered the nation, and if I may use the current coin which really works when we are out there in our constituencies, that is Modi's guarantee for the country for the future. <laughs> Friends, uh, laying the foundation of Bharat is truly our journey in the Amrit Kal, where we are able to convert even our problems, our difficulties, the crisis the nation faces into opportunities. We saw that during COVID, when the world was very stressed about what will happen in India. We didn't have a single starvation death. We didn't have riots on the streets, which some of the developed countries had for foodstuff, ransacking 
stores, ransacking department uh, stores and malls just to collect some food stuff. We had it in, I wouldn't like to take names, but some of the most developed and richest countries in the world. India did not have that because of proactive measures and the commitment that we as a nation, every single person in the country, had towards taking care of the other. That's the Bharat story, where we care for the other, where we, there, there is empathy and uh, concern for the collective welfare of today 1.4 billion people. The Atmanirbhar Bharat packages came up to address the problems of the time, whether it was giving twice the amount of food grain to 80 crore less privileged sections of society, the poor, the lower middle class, 80 crore people getting twice the ration so that nobody sleeps hungry. And I remember going to the Honorable Prime Minister that really, you know, a person can't be eating so much food. The amount we are giving out month after month. But look at his, his characteristic, his thinking, his empathy where he said, no problem. Maybe there'll be some extra, I'll share it with somebody else. But we want to make sure that at no point of time, if there's any delay, we don't know what is going to happen in COVID. If we were all, in a way, struggling with the unknown. Science had no answers. And I, I suspect even today, there are still a lot of questions around COVID which remain unanswered. But he wanted to make sure that unlike the Spanish flu, where nearly, or rather more people died of starvation in India than of the Spanish flu itself, Prime Minister Modi made sure we didn't have a single starvation death in the country. And similarly, we embarked on a massive infrastructure development program. And I think the seeds of our journey to 2047, of the Amrit Kal, during which we are looking at rapid industrialization, rapid growth of modern 21st century infrastructure to meet the needs of tomorrow, where we are looking at inclusive and sustainable growth of the entire nation, north, south, east, west, the remotest parts of the country. That foundation has been set in the last 10 years which rests on three pillars principally. One, Garib Kalyan, welfare of the poor. Because as we take the people out of poverty, and 25 crore people have come out of multidimensional poverty in the last few years, as more and more people don't have to worry about their day-to-day -day needs, roti, kapda, makan, shiksha, swas, Bijli, Sadak, Pani, we've all heard these over the years. The issues which used to be matters of concern for millions and millions of people. Karodo log, pura jeevan nikal dete te, in samasyaon se jhoolte jhoolte. I was traveling on a Vistara uh, day before yesterday to come to Delhi. And while just scrolling on the screen on different films, I saw Gharonda. I don't know if any of you, the, maybe our senior people here will remember Garonda, Amol Palikar movie, and Zarina Bahab. That's I couldn't remember the lady's name. And for the youngsters today, it may be silly. My wife asked me, why are you watching Garonda? It was just to, it was just so nostalgic. How middle class families, how the less privileged sections had to struggle lifetimes and how they were cheated out of their small savings, earned with great difficulty, moonlighting, working 18, 16 hours a day to collect the small amount of money paid to a real estate agent or a real estate builder. No receipt forthcoming because that was the economy at that point of time. Ke ye to unofficial paisa hai, iski koi receipt nahi milegi. Only to be jilted out of their savings. We saw so much of that happening in Noida, 
we saw so much of that happening in different parts of the country i had uh, journalists come up to me and say that we booked a flat in uh, noida 12 years ago 15 years ago and we still don't see sight of that flat all of these issues had somehow kept the nation back people didn't have the confidence that we can be demand creators with issues like health being taken care of through ayushman bharat almost 55 crore people eligible for it 80 crore people getting free food grains 4 crore families which is almost 20 crore people now live under a proper pakka house a home every home is going has already been uh, benefited with a toilet 11 crore toilets being built every home will have a tap connection taking water to their home one of the biggest problems due to which we had healthcare issues toilets and water this holistic thinking is the modi guarantee to ensure that the day to day needs the regular needs of every person can be taken care of and they can then aspire for a better future now with nearly 100 crore people connected on the internet they are all the time watching what's happening in sydney what's happening in singapore in dubai in london or paris or tokyo or uh, los angeles the world is in our phones right there and that is the aspirational india the young man or woman now aspiring for the good things of life with his basic necessities taken care of that's the first pillar garib kalyan and bringing people out of poverty making them aspirational for a better future and driving demand and growth the second pillar strong macroeconomic fundamentals business standard does or the people assembled here don't need to know what the situation in 2014 was if at all some of you need to know more about it just look up the white paper nirmala ji took out a few months ago it lays bare how delicate and fragile the indian economy was we were the fragile five 11th largest but amongst the weakest double digit inflation tottering growth high interest rates low foreign exchange reserves in every respect the morale of the nation was down corruption scandals tumbling out of the cupboard every month after month the indian passport not gaining us any respect when we went across the world exports flat and investments almost at a standstill this 10 year period have been a period in which we have brought back our credibility in the world we have not only moved to the fifth largest economy but in prime minister modi's third term and i suspect in the next 3 years we will be the third largest economy of the world and that's not a matter of chance it's not as if it's going to happen on its own it will happen because of very focused efforts our foreign exchange reserves last i read was 636 billion dollars more than twice what we had inherited from 11 months of import we are uh, from 6 months of import in 14 we are up to about uh, nearly a year's import today not only is the foreign exchange twice we have even repaid the 30 billion dollars borrowed at very high interest rates as fcnrb deposits in two august september 2013 i'm sure it's bhattacharya you would remember the rupee had collapsed in august 2013 to 68 rupees to a dollar country was unsure what will happen the government had to pay nearly two percent more and shore up its foreign exchange reserves by borrowing at about 30 billion dollars 
we had unpaid food subsidy bills. We had oil bonds, more than a lakh of crores. All of these have been repaid by the Modi government in the last 10 years. And through all of these efforts, today I have zero food subsidy bill spending. On the contrary, the food ministry makes calls to the states, please submit your final bills, your cost sheets. And we have cleared years and years of pendency. In some cases, 12 or 13 year old bills are all getting cleared through higher allocations from the budget and clearing all the state's dues which are left unpaid for several years, over a decade now. The idea being that our economy today has almost become the envy of the world. Amongst the developing economies, our foreign currency is, amongst, is the most stable. In fact, uh, in the last conversation I had with the CEO of BlackRock, uh, Larry Fink, we were discussing various uh, issues. And he said, oh, when we came to foreign currency, he said, oh, rupee dollar parity, we are very comfortable. We are not concerned about the depreciation of the rupee anymore. If at all, the one issue he raised was the higher imports of gold. And he said, we need to address that issue. Can we work or can I help you? And I've actually, uh, the Honorable Prime Minister also has discussed with colleagues and uh, has suggested that we must look at how we can recycle our gold reserves. And we have amongst the world's highest gold in the country. How can we uh, leverage that also to help growth grow uh, of the nation, faster growth of the nation? So we are all the time looking for newer ideas which help us in the growth trajectory. That's the second pillar, strong macroeconomic fundamentals. Growth is at significant highs compared to the rest of the world getting into depression. Our interest rates, save and accept the last year and a half, uh, have been amongst the lowest we've seen in India. I do believe that cycle also will come back now with the strong reining in of inflation. Inflation over the decade of Modi government has been the lowest, and I wish BS could do some study of the past. Our decadal inflation is the lowest in India's history, independent history, which also is a strong factor to keep the currency stable and help our growth uh, grow and, and interest rates come down. And the third pillar, friends, is infrastructure. The deep focus on infrastructure has helped getting the benefit or leveraging the multiplier impact that infrastructure investments gets us. I mean, I think that's something I don't need to tell this August audience that every rupee spent on infrastructure has, I'm told, nearly 3x or 3.4x an impact on the economy. It kickstarts so many other industries. A, it creates jobs in significant measure, it creates work opportunities for contractors, for our Vishwakarmas, masons, carpenters, electricians, all people get more jobs. It gives you demand for steel, cement, furniture, carpets, televisions, electronic goods, internet systems, you name it, upholstery, I can just keep going on and on, cameras. It just completely transforms the demand scenario. Then you see imports go up because you don't have enough domestic capacity. When imports go up, investors see an opportunity. They know, oh, there is demand for these goods and services in the country. Let's invest in this country. And the virtuous cycle of growth, mark my words, against the vicious cycle that corruption and lethargy brought to the nation from 4 to 14. From 14 to 24, the Modi government has been able to leverage the virtuous cycle of growth through massive focus on areas like infrastructure, areas like industrial growth in electronics, in semiconductors, in areas like PLI schemes to encourage or kickstart domestic manufacturing to meet the growing needs of India. 
And therefore, today, these three pillars, Garib Kalyan, strong macroeconomic fundamentals, which is on the back of our effort to make India corruption-free India, Sushashan, good governance has been our calling card, and focus on infrastructure. And by infrastructure, I mean very high quality infrastructure. I, I don't know how many of you have traveled on the coastal road which has been opened up, or in Mumbai, or at the Atal Setu, in the Trans Harbor Link, about which we've been hearing for 30 years. But as Prime Minister Modi says, there are so many tasks that were left either in the drawing board or unfinished, which he has had the privilege of completing. This itself, I hope you have enjoyed the facilities of Bharat Mandapam. Uh, I'll ask them to open the Leaders' Summit Room and the Leaders' Lounge, where the G20 was held. It's right across the road, I mean, across this room. And uh, since it's a very uh, nice group of youngsters and all, I'll even allow them access into that room. You can sit in the place where the Honorable Prime Minister sat or where the US President sat and uh, click your photos. Anybody from ITPO here? I'll, I'll make sure they open up those rooms in your lunch break or something. Just don't mess it up and keep it uh, carefully. We normally just allow uh, the door to be opened and keep a barricade there, but uh, we'll make an exception for all of you who have come here. And, and this is the new India. We've had Bharat Techs, we've had Bharat Mobility, we've had a startup Mahakum, all three, the first of its kind in India, Never before has the mobility sector all come together on one page. Entire textile value chain, end to end, from farmer to fashion to foreign, the farm to fiber to, fab to factory to fashion to foreign, the 5F vision with sustainable textiles. But we couldn't do it because we never had a venue like this. And believe it or not, Bharat Tex had to take this venue and Yashobhumi. And by the way, both were opened within a span of 30 days. This was launched on 26 July 2023, and Yashobumi came up in August. Two venues, if you haven't seen Yashobumi, do visit Yashobumi. It'll make you proud as an Indian. These are the facilities which will now, these facilities will bring mice to India. We won't have to go to Hanover or Frankfurt to attend big uh, exhibitions and conferences. The world will come to India. And I've already authorized phase two expansion of both Yashobhumi and Bharat Mandapam. In less than seven months, that's been the level of success. And by the way, in Bharat Techs, initially they were very hesitant. Finally, they ran out of space with two venues. And the tents came up again. We wanted to remove the tents. It's a big facility. But we ran out of space. And again, we had to put up four hangars. That's India for you. That's the new India. And I believe the India of today is an India that the world trusts. Aaj Bharat ki vishwas niyata. Bharat ke netratwa ki vishwas niyata. Bharat ke logo ke upar jo vishwas hai. The trust the world has in 140 crore Indians is unparalleled in India's independent history. And I believe the Vixit Bharat roadmap rests today on seven principles, if you can call it the Saptarishi principles. One, inclusive development. We have already taken out 25 crores from multidimensional poverty. We need to see them sustain and now grow into middle class and then upper middle class. That growth story has to be inclusive and that is the effort of the country and the government. Two, we need to reach the last mile, what Prime Minister calls saturation 
of government policies, programs, and schemes. Everybody should benefit without, without any discrimination. That has been our hallmark. Never has anybody been asked his caste, his creed, his religion, his language, his state. Never. It's been inclusive. Bina bhed bhav. Har ek ka adhikar hai. And uh, it, it hurts us when certain people try to say that there should be a caste census. You don't want to divide India. Does anybody in this room want to divide India? You want to you want to get unity into the country. You want to unite the people. You can't say jitna jan sankhya utni adhar. You can't say like a honorable member of parliament who also incidentally happens to be the brother of the deputy chief minister of a state makes a comment that if one state in the south doesn't get as much money as they uh, contribute to the treasury they will have to consider separating from India. Southern states may have to consider separating from India. Can anybody over here even imagine that in your dreams? I was aghast when I heard that. A north-south divide being created. Tomorrow, if Jharkhand and Chhattisgarh were to say, well, the coal that we have is ours to use, the rest of the country will be in darkness. If Punjab, Haryana and UP were to say the grain is ours, we will use it the way we like. The rest of the country will run out of food grains. If Maharashtra was to say the ports, Maharashtra, Gujarat were to say, or Andhra and the, the coastal says the ports are ours, UP and Kashmir would not be able to be a part of the international foray that India has delved into. India is one Bharat Ek Desh hai. Or we have to reach the last mile across the country as one nation. Third, infrastructure and growing investments, both in industry and infrastructure, will be the third pillar. Fourth, entrepreneurship, innovation, and the startup ecosystem. I think. Our young men and women really make us proud with the fantastic work that you are doing. Fifth, green growth and new age technologies. Sustainability is at the centerpiece of India's growth story. And we'll have to connect with new age technologies so that we don't remain left behind. Sixth, the power of Gyan. Of course, Gyan is knowledge. And there's huge knowledge and power. But as the Honorable Prime Minister has suggested, the Garib, Yuva, Andradata, or Nari. The poor youth, our farmers, and our women power. If we can respect these, this country has a brilliant and bright future. And we are committed, whether it's through the PM GKY, the Pradhan Mantri Garib Kalyan Anyojana, whether it's uh, the Women's Reservation Bill, whether it's our effort to increase skill development of youth and women, whether it's the various initiatives to empower the farmers, increase their incomes, whether it's the PM Mudra Yojana to help uh, entrepreneurs get into small businesses, whether it's Start Up India, Stand Up India, there's a plethora of opportunities for our gyan. And finally, the financial sector, financial inclusion, digital economy, fintech, the jandan accounts, the direct transfer of money to beneficiaries. These seven pillars will take distraught India of 2014 to developed India of 2014. 24 and beyond. Today the world is looking up to India. It is for us to grab that opportunity. And I have no doubt in my mind that today's Bharat aspires, today's Bharat inspires, and today's Bharat achieves big dreams, big goals, big future for India, 
And that is what I think this mantan is all about. My best wishes to each and every one of you in this journey of India, a Vixit Bharat at 2047. May God bless you in this journey. Some of us may not be there to celebrate 2047 as a developed and prosperous nation. But I'm sure our young boys and girls, our men and women in this room, in this journey of Vixit Bharat, will play an important role and will take this country to greater heights. God bless you. Thank you, Honorable Minister, for your encouragement and uh, such an incisive, thought-provoking uh, lecture. Uh, it's also reassuring that you told us that won't be a Jack Ma moment ever in this country, thanks to us, fearless media. Uh, you know, your, your prognosis of how leadership is about turning crisis into opportunity from, you know, from the Shivaji's time to, to the current times how virtue, virtuous cycle of growth was built up by using three pillars of Garib Kalyan, strong macroeconomic growth and infrastructure was really uh, very, very interesting. There are lots of takeaways this audience may have, uh, but thank you for such a uh, nice and uh, honest from the heart lecture. May I now invite uh, Mr. Bhattacharya on stage uh, to start uh, the fireside chat with the minister. Uh, over to you, AKB. Thank you so much. Uh, I forgot to apologize at the beginning that I, I came a little late, but we are right now in the midst of total election fever. So I have been having meetings since 9 in the morning on various things. In fact, the person at 9 landed up while I was still doing my yoga. So I had to really rush. Uh, my apologies to all of you. So Sorry? <clears throat> No, it was not because of traffic. traffic. I got late yeah. because of some political meeting. So my apologies yeah. to all of you. No, no, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Minister. Uh, thanks, Ailesh, uh, for summing it up so well. Um, uh, I will try to be brief in my questions, but you have given us courage uh, so that maybe we can ask you some difficult questions. Uh, <laughs> uh, my, my, my first question, uh, Mr. Minister, you, you are the Minister for Trade and Investment. In that sense, if, if I take away the food and textiles and consumer affairs from that, uh, what kind of uh, trade policy that you would envisage for this country going forward? Uh, because that's, uh, that's a very key component of India's economic policy vision. Uh, in a sense, we have fiscal policy from the finance minister, we have got to get the trade policy from you, we'll have the monetary policy from the RBI. So from a trade and investment minister's perspective, uh, what would be your perspective on the trade policy going forward in light of certain comments made by some eminent trade economist, uh, I, I can name him, Dr. Arvind Panagaria, who is now the Finance Commission Chairman, that India needs to continue to pursue an open trade policy. I don't want to get into the nitty gritty of it, sure. but I would like you to uh, you know, enlighten this audience. Uh, what is their open trade policy for you and trade policy? Yeah. First of all, I must clarify that this government doesn't work in silos. Whether it's finance, whether it's commerce, industry, whether it's the Reserve Bank, yeah. they all work in tandem for what is good for the people of India. So when we do fiscal policy or monetary or trade, yeah. there's a huge amount of alignment amongst all of us, point one. Point two, we respect and recognize and welcome and value different viewpoints. Mr. Arvind Panagriya is a very, very old friend. In yeah. fact, uh, I probably introduced him into our system yeah. about 15 years ago, 14 years ago, yeah. Yeah. when I first came to know him. And uh, we deeply respect his views. Yeah. But I do believe that as a developing country, as a country which has a long way to go before mm -hmm. we are able to have a completely free and open economy with capital account convertibility, yeah. with almost nil or very low import duties. We have to look at our trajectory and calibrate the trade policy as the country moves through the cycle of growth. You can't have a one-size-fits-all. So what worked for America in, the tw in 2024 
need not work for India at the same time. America used all these trade protectionist measures when they were developing to become a prosperous country. Even today, by the way, I wish uh, you would do a study and come out. Mm -hmm. What is the level of protection that is given in terms of import duties on agricultural goods in Europe or in the United States of America? On peanut butter, I think it's 300% import yeah. duty. I wonder where open trade ha goes at that point of time. So every country, and we are an agrarian country, half our population nearly is still directly, indirectly dependent on agriculture. The United States agriculturists would barely be 2% of their population. Actually, I suspect not even 2%. Not even 2% even of their population. Yeah. Many European countries have 5,000 farmers, 10,000 farmers. But they fight at WTO tooth and nail against us who have nearly 140 million families dependent on agriculture. Yeah. So I think you need to calibrate. You need a practical approach. Having said that, I do believe we'll have to internationalize our economy, look at greater degree of engagement with the world. We'll have to look at rapid growth in exports. I don't know if you're aware, in the last three years, up to March 24, from 21 to 24, our exports have gone up both in goods and services by about 55, 60%. And I think it's no main achievement for a nation on its growth trajectory to have this kind of a growth. This year would be a little flat or a little bit on the positive side. Goods and services together will continue to be positive despite two wars and the Red Sea crisis. So it shows you, and you all always project into the future, what the potential of our trade is. We'll be doing $2 trillion of exports by 2030, by the end of this decade. $2 trillion. And I have no doubt in my mind we'll achieve. Okay. So our trade policy is calibrated based on our development journey, yet open to expansion. We've done trade deals with EFTA, we are in yeah. dialogue with EU and UK, Peru, Chile, some countries in the GCC. Uh, we are renegotiating badly done FTAs with yeah. Japan, Korea, and ASEAN when there was hardly any stakeholder consultations. And today, you find so much criticism and so much uh, negativity in industry and business in India about the Japan, Korea, and ASEAN FTAs. <laughs> I'm almost tempted at times to recommend whether we should reconsider having those FTAs at all. But our FTAs are with tremendous stakeholder consultation. We walked out of RCEP, the Regional Comprehensive yeah. Economic Partnership, which was one of the most, which was the lousiest decision. I'm using a harsh word. It was one of the most threatening decisions that the UPA government could have taken. We were not a part of RCEP originally. The okay. then Congress government and you, their partners, which are the same as the Indy partners today, they decided to jump into RCEP. No consultations with the people of India, with industry, with agriculturists, with farmers, with MSME, with pharma, no discussion. If, God forbid, Mr. Modi hadn't come into government and he didn't have the courage of conviction to take a hard decision to walk out of RCEP, on 4th of November 2019, I dare say India couldn't have seen the kind of growth story, the journey of today, or the confidence to make India a developed nation by 2047 would have all been lost. We would have been flooded with substandard, low quality goods coming in from certain geographies and killed the investment appetite and investment climate of India. So that, that, that RCEP decision was taken mainly for, you're not mentioning the country, but because of China. Am I right? 100%. Yeah. Can you believe it, friends? RCEP had, who were the stakeholders in RCEP? The 10 ASEAN countries, Japan, Korea, 12, Australia, New Zealand, 14, China, 15. It was amongst them. India was not a part of the RCEP story. In 2012, I think, India at the highest level, at the then Prime Minister's level, there's some body which is the highest policy-making body on trade and economic policy. 
they decided to join the RCEP negotiations. Suomoto. India jumped into the fray, little recognizing that we are dealing with a country which doesn't have transparent economic policies at all. Without assessing how much damage they had already caused because of badly negotiated FTAs with Japan, Korea, and Asia. And we already had FTA with 12 countries. With Australia, we, we were already on the verge of closing an FTA at that time also, which then got aborted because of RCEP. New Zealand, our total trade was $300 billion, a small little country. So what was RCEP? It was a free trade agreement between China and India that we had jumped into. And the kind of opaque and non-transparent policies of China, already Indian industry is threatened. And so we are investing deeply in India, PLI, and all of these to expand our domestic growth so we remove our dependence on countries like China. Okay, I mean, so uh, one would understand from you is that if there is any, China is in any of the trading blocks, India will not be party to that. Not necessary. If China opens up its economy, makes it transparent, works with the rules of WTO. Okay. I mean, I, I remember in one of the meetings, I also had six, eight months, I became Commerce Minister in, on 31st May, I think, yeah. 2019. So I had five months in which I had 200 stakeholder consultations, 200, with every sector of Indian industry. Ek swar mein, ek awaj mein, sab ne opposed kiya. So asa. which was a bigger factor, China or domestic industry? I'll explain to you. Yeah. And sab kit concern kya thi? China may have market access when we go to China they put roadblocks when we go to Japan Korea they put non-tariff barriers steel industry until a few months ago after my struggle of four or five years could not sell one kilo of steel in Japan and Korea even though we had the same better quality or the same quality and hundred dollars a ton cheaper but they have that nationalist spirit they support each other but don't allow other countries to enter their geography. With China, I asked my counterpart with whom I was negotiating. I said, you know, we were having coffee. And I'm, I'm not exaggerating. This is the example that I used. We were both sitting and having coffee. I said, you know, your coffee cup and saucer being imported into India comes at a price which is less than the raw material cost in India. How do you manage that? He said, we are efficient. I said, fine. I accept you are efficient. Just give me one assurance that you will, when, if we ask you for information, you will open your cards, whether the money for this all was remitted from India or part of it came from India and part of it came from third sources, basically implying that there is under invoicing. Or the quality standards, if we impose, you will guarantee that you give us the good quality product. He says, no, no, no. We can't tell you where the money came from. You want to do whatever you do at your customs border. We will not open up our cards. It was one of those defining conversations when I realized RCEP cannot be good for Indian industry. It will kill the Indian economy. Okay, let me change subject. Uh, thanks for this clarification. Um, uh, you're also the Minister for Investment. Uh, and uh, as you also beautifully explained uh, how the government has uh, come in a big way as, uh, uh, as a source of investment, uh, particularly in the infrastructure sector in the, in the post-COVID years, uh, at a time when the private sector was not really investing enough, so it was a much needed thing. Uh, there was a very good story on foreign investment in the post-COVID years. But in the last one year, one has seen uh, that uh, foreign investment flow decelerating it a bit. Uh, are you worried? And what needs to be done? Uh, because if you look at the foreign equity infl flows from last year and in the first nine months, there is a, a decline. And, and how would you uh, assess it? And what is the way forward? And how do you prevent that kind of a decline? Mr. Bhattacharya is a dear friend. Yeah. So I'll take the liberty. <laughs> of uh, making a light comment. This is elementary, my dear Watson. Okay. 
And I would think business standard and its journalists yeah. who are known for deep research into any subject would clearly know that a country which for seven years in a row under Mr. Modi's charge, seven years, it's not a post-COVID growth of foreign investment. Seven years in a row, we had record foreign direct investment. Year after year, we broke the previous record. Next year, we broke the previous record. Next year, we broke another record. Seven years. What happened in the last two years? Interest rates in the developed world shot through the roof. From less than half percent, they are now touching or going to touch 5% in the United States. Half or 0.75% to 5%. Now, when the interest rates in the developed world for blue chip government guilds are at such highs, it's quite elementary and obvious that there'll be an outward flow of capital. And new capital will go a little sluggish or slow. Mm -hmm. Yet, if you see the numbers, they're not that bad. Some of the numbers in other emerging economies have collapsed totally. Our numbers fell nominally. Yeah. And they've again started inching up. They have I don't know. I, I read a report probably in your paper yeah, now. Yeah. I don't know yeah. because yeah. you are one of my preferred morning reads. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think uh, we saw only in the yeah. stock market FDI yeah. figure, I don't recall. There is the no, there is no doubt that uh, globally also FDI flows have come down. Yeah, so, so uh, ours are, are less. You have to compare so Apple I, to Apple. Emerging I, markets. I'm just saying emerging. that is there is something that you are thinking in terms of because foreign investment. Obviously, flow we are has thinking. Thing. Yeah. Otherwise, the EFTA agreement about yeah. which Selesh yeah. alluded yeah. in his talk. I I don't know whether you have realized that we have done another path a path breaking initiative. Never before in the history of the world yeah, has a free trade agreement been signed or agreed where a country without a bilateral investment treaty, right. this is not a BIT, this is a free trade agreement. It's about goods and services. We have a commitment from Switzerland, Norway, Liechtenstein, and Iceland, four nations together. Commitment to invest hundred billion dollars additional. Their current investment is only 10 billion dollars in FDI. They have committed to invest a hundred billion more and create 10 lakh jobs directly. Indirect would be another 30, 40 lakh jobs okay. in India in the next 15 years in lieu of market access. Now market access, I don't lose anything because Switzerland, the cost of production can never hurt India's interests. They make very high quality stuff, very high value stuff. The machineries they make and all are things we don't have in India. Rather, we need them in India. So I lose nothing by giving them market That's access right. on goods domestically made in Switzerland or Norway. Okay. Okay. I've not given market access on agriculture, so farmers are not threatened. Mm -hmm. MSME is not threatened because they can't compete ever in their life with MSMEs. A farmer is proud today that India has an FTA with a chapter on IPR from the world's biggest threat to IPR. Switzerland was the country which always opposed India's IPR regime. We should be proud as a nation. Switzerland has signed an FTA with a robust IPR chapter without our giving up on any of our rights. Our generic medicines are protected. Our, all the protections we needed are in that FTA, in that IPR chapter. Yes. Pharma industry, Indian pharma industry, was a part of the negotiation, sitting in the room. Yes. That is the Modi style of functioning. That's right. And pharma industry has thanked me. And when we signed the FTA in the evening celebrations in the Bharat Mandapam, in the room you will see, okay. we signed in the leader's room, summit room, we celebrated in the leaders lounge. The pharma industry stood up on stage and said, we warmly and heartily welcome this okay. IPR chapter and the FTA. That is yeah. the new style that India works with. Yeah. My final question, uh, Mr. Minister, uh, and you alluded to that, uh, what is the state and what's the government's approach towards bilateral investment treaties? Because this is That's old not under my charge. Okay. Uh, we are happy that we've executed a 
BIT with UAE. Yes. We have a cautious approach. We are ensuring that India's interests are protected. But more specific details, I would not well, be able to okay. share with you. Okay. But I can assure you about one thing, certainly, mm -hmm. that the Modi government will always hold the national values, the nation's interests, and the interests of 1.4 billion Indians first. It is paramount that India's trajectory of growth, India's journey towards Vixit Bharat 2047 should not get hurt. Bharat ka lab sarvopari is the most important thing in any action that Mr. Modi and his team at any and every level, center or states, political or bureaucratic, at every level, the nation comes first. On this uh, reassurance, with this happy note, thank you very much, Mr. Minister. And uh, please give him a big hand for uh, making this possible.